Well, um, can I open <coughs> the, this evening's um, discussion um, by welcoming you first to this event, which has a um, simple question, which is, will the center hold? Where we'd like to explore um, the outcome, or at least likely outcome, of the forthcoming elections in the European Parliament, and specifically the role, if you like, of both centrist and extremist parties in shaping that outcome. I'm Jonathan Grant. Um, I'm director of the King's Policy Institute and a professor of public policy here at King's College. I have to say this is my third week in the job um, and the first event I am chairing, so I plead with you to be gentle with me. One of the roles of the King's Policy Institute is to convene occasions such as this with the aim of exchanging ideas and developing linkages between the academic community within which I include the student body and policymakers and politicians. So it's great to see such a diverse and interesting turnout um, this evening. We set up in um, 2012 a series called Europe in Crisis and we did that with sort of three thoughts in mind. There was a lot of debate at the time about what people termed the crisis. Um, the Euro crisis. There was also, um, at the time, and, and continuing that um, debate about the UK's relationship with Europe, and that's obviously been amplified with a commitment to a potential in-out referendum. And probably most importantly, um, what is the role of Europe in that broader global context looking to the future? And tonight is the first of um, three um, events we'll hold focused around the European parliamentary elections. So we're going to today sort of anticipate the outcome um, and in June we're going to reflect on the outcome and anticipate um, a new commission and what a new commission will look like. And then three months after that we'll reflect on what that new commission is and what the policy agenda for that commission is likely to be. This evening we're very honored to have three outstanding contributors to our discussion. We have Peter Kellner, David Cowling, and Catherine de Vries. Each will make a short presentation about their various um, views um, around, if you like, our exam question, will the center hold? And after that, we would very much like to have a discussion um, between you and our panel members and between our panel members debating these issues. And we have deliberately scheduled a lot of time for that discussion because that is um, the prime purpose of tonight's event. So let me introduce our panel members. I'll introduce all three of them now, um, and then we'll move on to the presentations. Um, starting at the end of the table, we have um, Peter, who will be a familiar face to a number of you. He is president of YouGov, um, a company that focuses on public opinion and consumer behavior using very innovative, at least at the time when YouGov was established, very innovative online approaches to capturing polling information and public opinion. He was a journalist and political commentator for over 30 years, working for a number of broadsheets, including the Sunday Times, The Independent, as well as um, working on TV, including BBC Newsnight and the Channel 4 News. And he continues to advise various august organizations on polls and public opinion, including the, or ranging from, if you like, the Bank of England to the TUC. Next door to Peter, we have David, David is a visiting senior research fellow here at King's College. Um, he, if I may say, seems to have followed the opposite path to Peter in his career. He began working in polling um, and moved into journalism and en route um, held various advisory posts in politics, including being a special advisor to Peter Shaw, the Secretary of State for Environment in the late 1970s. David moved into journalism in 1986 when he joined ITN and in 1999 joined the BBC as editor of political research. He specializes in opinion poll research, um, both in interpreting the results of polls, but also in helping the BBC commission polls. Our final speaker would be Catherine de Vries. Catherine is professor of European politics at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford and is a fellow at Lincoln College. Her research interests are very much trying to understand the importance of today's societal and political challenges, especially in the context of the Euro crisis and the rise of Eurosceptic and anti-immigration um, parties um, across Europe. She has led on and contributes to a number of very large-scale 
um, data-driven projects that look at these issues and is constantly working to integrate um, research and research data and research analysis in the policy and political um, process. She is currently completing, it says here, I don't know if it's completed yet, um, that's, that's coming, her book, um, Bridging Europe, How Domestic Elections Help Foster Democracy in the European Union. So I hope you agree that we've got a, a very eminent panel. I will now hand over to Peter to say a few words and um, kick off proceedings. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I've got a sore throat, so if, if my voice fades, I, I apologize, or perhaps it's your good fortune. Um, I, I want to look at where I, I think we'll be um, in the European elections and to put it into a very, very broad brush historical context. Here in Britain, UKIP in 99 um, came fourth, in 2004 came third, in 2009 came second. The more mathematically inclined amongst you may spot a pattern. And indeed, I, I, I think uh, as things stand, they're likely to come first. Let me be precise. Were the election to be held now to the European Parliament, I think they would come first. I don't know what will happen exactly in the next three months. Um, you know, UKIP could implode, something bizarre could happen or whatever. But uh, short of some um, uh, event that, that, that causes things to change, I think they will come top. Our, our latest YouGov poll in the European elections puts them second on around a quarter of the vote, uh, a few points behind Labour, a few points ahead of the Conservatives. In past European elections, um, they tend to gain a lot of support in, in the final weeks. And if you think of the European Parliament elections in British terms as, as roughly like a nationwide by-election, we know that the by-election phenomenon often in the past benefiting the Liberals, you've seen a very late run. So if nothing much changes, I would expect UKIP to end up ballpark 30%, Labour perhaps 25, the Conservatives rather less than 20. We can perhaps discuss subsequently or other speakers may cover the consequences of that if they agree with that prognosis. But what I want to do is ask um, how have we got here? Um, the breakthrough uh, for UKIP was in 2004 uh, when they got 16% of the vote and I think a dozen or so Euro MPs. Why is that significant? Because this predates the recession, Northern Rock, Lehman Brothers. So although in Britain, as in I think much of Europe, the recession and the hardships caused by the recession will undoubtedly give the nationalist stroke populist stroke far right parties a boost, it isn't simply down to um, the recession. And of course there's a small bonus that UKIP will get, which is that last time the BNP got 6% of the votes and two seats. The BNP had self-destructed, uh, perhaps assisted suicide, I don't know. Um, and so I think a chunk of that vote will go straight across um, to, to UKIP. Um, but the question I want to pose and suggest a very brief answer to, because I think the answer, uh, similar answers can be uh, given across Europe, because in much of Europe, whether you look at the Front National in, in France or the Northern League in Italy or, or the populist parties in the Netherlands or, or, or Scandinavia, um, the same thing can be said. But you can see the um, stirrings of them going back often 10, 20, 30 years. And what I want to suggest is that, I take a deep breath here, Karl Marx was in one important respect right. And I don't mean the economics of Das Kapital, which since I've not read it, uh, I, I would be reluctant to analyze too deeply, but the broader commentary of the 1840s and 50s, for example, in the Communist Manifesto, the essential insight of Marx was that capitalism led, unless checked, to, to monopoly and insecurity um, and to uh, upheaval and to familiar relationships being lost. And the big picture point I wish to put to you is that for the first 30 or so years after the Second World War across Western Europe, 
uh, a time of, of growth, of full employment, of recovery from the Second World War, of rebuilding ravaged economies. It was also a period of, of sticky markets. And indeed, the whole liberal Thatcherite, and I tell you Thatcherite objectively, not as an insult on this occasion, um, that if you like, the liberal agenda was in part uh, as a, a theoretically valid critique of the stickiness of markets. The proposition that to get the real dynamism and growth and innovation um, and benefits of capitalism, you needed to free up markets. And so um, over the last 20, 30 years, starting at slightly different points in different countries, this is what we have seen. And we've also seen, of course, globalization going uh, alongside that. <coughs> And what has also happened, and it seems to me there's a fairly obvious <coughs> direct relationship, whether one approves or disapproves uh, of all this, is that uh, in, across the industrialized world, there was a gradual trend towards greater equality in the first three decades after the Second World War. Jobs were on the whole secure, and the proportion of GDP going to labor tended to rise very gradually, going to profits tended to fall very gradually. And all that was reversed in the era of liberalization. So you've had greater inequality, you've had greater insecurity, you've had GDP going more to profit than to labor. Um, now, as I say, there may well be a very, very good case for all this happening, that the benefits massively outweigh the drawbacks. But the proposition I want to put to you is that the real phenomenon underlying the rise of, of nationalism and populism, anti-immigration in Britain, anti-EU feeling, is associated with, not wholly but largely explained, by the growth of, of insecurity and inequality, of people feeling that the world is slipping away from them, life isn't what it used to be. They're no longer as confident that their children will have a better future uh, than they will have. So that, um, you asked to take 10 minutes, so I, I, I will broadly stop there for you to ponder, perhaps challenge, but that to me is as a, the big explanation of why in Britain and in other countries we are, we are where we are. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Seems like we've got a new exam question, mm -hmm. is was Karl Marx right? Mm -hmm. um, but we'll save that for another, another session. David, can I hand over to you? Thank you. May I say, Chair, you won't, undercooking it when you said it was likely to be a pretty rough crowd. Um, mm. Could I take a view really that sits, so ask you to see me as the grumpy relative who invites himself to Christmas lunch is a real dampener on the event as well as demolishing that bottle of vintage port you were definitely saving for another occasion. The reason I say that is my proposition is that the issue of Europe doesn't really matter to the overwhelming majority of people in the UK, even in European elections. By any definition, the European Union plays a significant role in the life of our country. I, I, for one, would never question that for a minute, but it seems to me absurd for anybody to query that. However, who would guess from our knowledge of, as a nation, our interest in Europe, that we've been fully members for 40 years? 40 years. Just look at the levels of awareness in the UK of the EU and its institutions regularly reported in the Eurobarometra polls. It makes somber reading, believe me, if you haven't dived into it yourself. During that period, bitter divisions over Europe have come close to destroying first the Labour Party and then the Conservatives. In the early 80s, we had one of the great splits in the British political system with the SDP split, principally on the issue of Europe, although not alone. Then Labour passed the poison chalice to the Conservative Party, and they equally were divided, electing a succession of leaders under the, under the banner anybody but Ken Clark. Um, even though Ken Clark was, by all accounts, in terms of public opinion, the most popular choice they could have made in terms of their leadership, yet they couldn't stomach that. Because, again, in, in the Conservative Party then, as the Labour Party before, the issue of where you stood on Europe defined who you were, whether you were good, whether you were bad. <coughs> Yet, so all of that was going on, all of that is unquestioned. Yet, in the 10 general elections held since we joined the EU 40 years ago, can we name one, just one, 
where strong anti-European policies, policies benefited the party that promoted them. <coughs> Labour's 1983 commitment to leave the EU. What could be plainer? What could be more attractive? And yet it didn't stop them smashing to their worst defeat since the 1930s. The Conservative 2001 campaign, having William Hague racing around the country telling people about the countdown for saving the pound, did not save the Conservatives of that election from registering their second worst general election vote share since 1832. Now we understand the Conservatives have a secret weapon which has caused a referendum and they're going to nail Ed Miliband <coughs> to the wall to try and get him to uh, disagree with having a referendum and there's your clincher, really? Where in our history is there any evidence to suggest that that will work? Because the issue, I think, of Europe does not float the boat of the British public. Now, most polls, when they offer uh, subjects to people, give a list. Either it's read across or it's, it's given before of topics, and people are asked to indicate which topics they think are the most important uh, in the it, facing the country today. Now, Maury, um, if I dare mention uh, the mm -hmm. name, um, present company, um, they have a unique system whereby it's spontaneous. They say to you, what is the most important issue facing Britain today, and then there is silence. You have to volunteer it. Spontaneous mentions of Europe, not prompted, spontaneous mentions of Europe rarely rise above 2%, above 2% as the most important issue facing Britain today and the Mori Issues Index. Only immigration seems to resonate with the public as an issue with the European dimension. The problem is that European elections have been have never been taken seriously by British voters. We might rail against that, we might think it's mad, but I fear, I think the evidence is conclusive that they don't take them seriously. They seem to view them as a pain-free opportunity to kick the political establishment on a scale that to date they haven't repeated in Westminster elections. And ever since the introduction of proportional voting in 1999, a significant and increasing share of the European vote has gone to parties outside the magic circle of Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, Clyde and SNP. If you take those people who voted for those parties in 1999, 19% didn't vote for them. In 2004, 33% didn't vote for them. In 2009, 40% didn't vote for them. It is not to say that you cannot find British people who will say endless things about Europe. They'll go rabbit, rabbit, rabbit endlessly. But the trouble is, you have to poke them first with a stick to remind them about Europe before they remember how angry it makes them. And I put it to you, that degree of prompting <coughs> does not register for me as the sort of subject that is actually going to make or break elections. Um, I would then go on to say, in my positive way, um, elections with relatively small turnouts, the results, of course, can turn on the enthusiasm or lack of it among supporters of individual parties. I'm not sure what Peter's polling is finding, but there was an ICM poll <coughs> earlier this month where 27% of people said they were certain to vote in the European election. So when we look at the 2014 result, before we choke on our own hyperbole, let us look at the actual numbers of votes for the parties and the share that they received. Because in these elections, as the Conservatives did, they certainly won in 2009, but with 27% of the vote. UKIP came second with a towering 16.5% of the vote. But finally, I just comment a bit about UKIP voters. We polenta-eating metrosexuals who drizzle nothing less than first-press virgin olive oil on our salad, we really don't get UKIP, do we, at all? Um, who are they? What do they want? They appear to be the stuff of nightmares for the Conservatives. They may be nightmares for other parties as well. Who knows? We'll find out. But there was a massive online poll commissioned by Michael Ashcroft in November 2012, which asked UKIP intending voters how they'd voted in 2010. On that occasion, 44% said that they had voted Conservative in 2010. 4% Labour, 14% Lib Dems, UKIP, 27. Others didn't vote 11%. What's their demographic profile? Two-thirds of UKIP voters are men, almost two-thirds are aged 55 plus, and half are C2DEs. This profile is strikingly different from those of Labour and Lib Dem voters, but also markedly different from the profile of Conservative voters. In his report, Ashcroft said, and I think endorsing many of the points that Peter was making, 
he made an observation, if you forgive me if I read it, because I think it's important. The single biggest misapprehension about the UKIP phenomenon is that it's about policies. The potential UKIP voters are dissatisfied with another party's policy in a particular area, usually Europe or immigration, prefer UKIP's policy instead, and would return to their original party if only its policy changed. In fact, in the mix of things that attract voters to UKIP, policies are secondary. It is much more to do with outlook. Analysis of our poll found the biggest predictor of whether a voter would consider UKIP is that they agree that the party is, quotes, on the side of people like me, close quotes. The idea that UKIP, quotes, seemed to want to take Britain back to a time when things were done more sensibly, end quotes, and that, quote, the bigger parties seem more interested in trendy nonsense than listening to ordinary people, close quotes, both of those elicited stronger agreement among UKIP considerers than the party's policy that Britain should leave the European Union. Finally, I'll just say this. The three main parties seem in a quandary about how to see off UKIP. Their real dilemma, it seems to me, is this. What is the question that for millions of people voting UKIP is the answer? Why are so many people seemingly uncomfortable in their own country, so alienated from the individuals, parties, and politics that govern their lives? The evidence from Ashcroft's poll suggests that millions of our fellow citizens feel their opinions are either ignored or marginalised. Most of them do not live in ethnically diverse London, have never eaten a country supper, nor simpered over Stephen Fry's latest Bon No, but they do have votes and they seem rather enthusiastic about using them. Thank you very much, David. And now we'll uh, hand over to Catherine. Thank you. I took the liberty of actually not answering the question, something that I Shame. never exactly Shame. tell my students to never do. Uh, the question, will the centre hold? No, probably not. Um, I'm Dutch, so uh, um, out of my own experience, I would think I would very much agree with what was said before. However, I wanted to deal with the underlying assumption that your scepticism might be something bad, and I would want to challenge that. Um, it takes a Dutch person to do that, apparently. Uh, imagine, I want to start with a thought experiment. Imagine that Jean Monnet dozed off in a meeting of the European Coal and Steel Committee in the early 50s and awoke in present day Europe. What would his reaction have been? His first reaction would have, won, would have been one with, of pride. Not only are over 500 million people citizens of the, Europe, of the European Union, the number of EU institutions have grown considerably, probably more than he would have imagined, so have their competencies, now stretching from agriculture to monetary policy to energy to foreign policy. Yet his second reaction might be one of surprise or even worry. Monet and the other uh, early architects of the European integration process expected citizens to rally around Europe. The unification process contributes to peace, trade, and people would see the benefits. This cartoon kind of illustrates what really happened. The opposite might be true. Elites have been so eager to pursue further integration that they seem to have lost track of the concerns and the desires of ordinary citizens. Mainstream political uh, uh, elites have moved forward uh, with European integration in a vacuum of public support, as it has become painfully evident in referenda, recent electoral national contexts, and on the street of Athens, Madrid, and Lisbon. However, accusations that political elites are out of touch are rarely new and are often politically motivated. Recent evidence suggests that in times of the, however, recent evidence suggests that the times of the permissive consensus in which elites decided where to cooperate and the public largely followed suit are over. Today we are witnessing a union in crisis, perhaps, grow, but at least what we are witnessing is growing popular discontent. This is some of the recent Eurobarometer survey that, uh, that, my, that was previously discussed. Here it's the six largest EU member states that represent about two-thirds of the EU population. And it shows <coughs> differences between May 2007, so prior, let's say, to the crisis, and the latest one, which is November 2013. What we see is that in May 2007, a majority of EU citizens, however, not the British, trusted EU institutions. Now this percentage, by November 2013, has dropped to lower than 30%, except in Poland. 
Although there have always been downturns in support before, it's clear that the recent crisis has kind of put a spotlight on Europe. Against this backdrop, you could wonder if this hypothesized reaction of Monet, the worry reaction, is justified. Should we as academics, pundits, uh, politicians worry about the increase of Euroscepticism? In many, um, across Europe's capitals, and I think many uh, people you talk to in Brussels would agree, this is a dangerous sign. This is a, a sick political system that needs to have some healthy solution by an institutional blueprint or <coughs> so ever. This is kind of based on a Tocquevillian notion of, of how uh, an effective democratic society should function. It crucially depends on citizen support and loyalty. Or in the words of a more recent social scientist, uh, Robert Putnam, in his work on making democracy work in bowling alone, in established democracies, growing numbers of citizens are questioning the effectiveness of their public institutions, not just in the European Union. In America, as he, that's what his bowling alone book is about, there is a reason to suspect that this democratic disarray may be linked to a broad and continuing erosion of civic engagement, of civic culture, that began a quarter of a century ago. According to Putnam, high on the America's agenda should be the question of how to reverse these trends. This seems to mimic kind of the discussion that we hear in Brussels and in many European capitals. We need a political system is in danger without a culture of trust, reciprocity, and civic engagement. So turn out to be a problem exactly. However, there's another democratic tradition, an alternative view, a more skeptical view of how much public support a system actually needs. And this uh, view is clearly found in the writings of the founding fathers of the country that Alex de Tocqueville visited and, and admired so much, the United States. For example, according to James Madison, who drew on Montesquieu and Hume, um, argues that elected and appointed office holders are no angels and are not very different than all of us. They might lack some qualities and therefore could become corrupt or should not be trusted. If men uh, were angels, we didn't need an, a government in the first place. As a result, in Madison's view, citizens should not trust the, their representatives, European or national, but just make sure that there's a system of control through periodic elections and institutional checks and balances. Not only do I think that this latter perspective is more convincing overall, for example, this country is notorious for its weak levels of trust in government, however, we probably would not question that it's democratic, um, but it's also it's very applicable to a multi-level system like the European Union. If we would adhere to the Tocquevillian view that people should have confidence in their political institutions or should trust politicians uh, because they act in their own best interest, the EU is in trouble. First, multi-level governance bundles together different nations. We know that most people, rightfully so probably, I feel more Dutch than I feel European, are emotionally attached to their member states. <coughs> that is to say, no European demos exists. So how can you trust politicians uh, based on trust of fellow citizens if that trust is, 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 is kind of localized in uh, the national state? Moreover, if you think about if politicians should act in the citizens' best interest, which interests should they be representing? The Dutch, the Spanish, the, the British, the Czech. Third, producing international public goods that are beneficial to all those EU citizens by definition is problematic. Policy making at the EU level, and I think the European stability mechanism has, has, has taught us that, will create winners and losers. So what we need is losers' consent. So against this backdrop, shouldn't a European citizen be more or less skeptical of this, of this multi-level uh, uh, government structure? Indeed, I develop the view that an increase in Euroscepticism is by no means a sign of a European disease, but rather a sign of Europeans trying to figure out what the system is, a maturation of public support, in some ways a manifestation of a healthy, critical loyalty. I fur the view that support that not support is the hallmark of a political culture for a functioning representative democracy at the national or at the, at the Euro European level, but a healthy skepticism. Um, or to quote the uh, ancient orator, uh, orator there's no um, safeguard known generally to be wise, which is an advantage, uh, an advantage and security to all, but especially to democracies against despots, and that's suspicion. So what then is that nature of European of EU skepticism? I would argue that EU attitudes have become real attitudes. 
they, these attitudes have gotten a clear structure and they're skeptic because they're supposed to be because that's the only way in which people in, the, the, in this very complex world can signal their discontent. So to talk about what, what people say in polls, this is just to show the number of don't, no responses in the, Europe, in the Eurobarometer over the years 1970 to 2010. The little peak of the increase of don't knows is as the newly established Eastern member states entered into the Eurobarometer. But overall, we see a decline. Actually, most people are able to now answer the question, is membership of your country uh, a good thing or not? So real attitudes. Also, structured attitudes. If we ask people if they trust the EU or trust their national government, we see that the Bulgarians are very rational. They trust the European Union more than their national uh, country <laughs> because uh, of enormous problems with corruption. The same uh, goes for Italy. The UK, um, I'm just going to leave that for now. The UK actually shows very, very similar levels of trust in national government and trust in the EU, so we shouldn't exacerbate this idea. I would argue that if you then ask people the question, well, is Europe moving in the right direction? What you see is indeed, since the financial crisis, an increase of people saying it's moving into the, into the wrong direction, right? But the question is, is that problematic? Right? So I think that's problematic only when there's no empowerment, right? So that links up with my previous. So here is an, here's an example of a country which was used to be a Eurosceptic country, but has become actually a quite uh, supportive country, and that's Denmark. Denmark was, had similar levels of Euroscepticism or distrust against Europe um, in the early 70s, actually to, to the late 1980s. As it started negotiating opt-outs, people start seeing, well, actually our government is empowered in Brussels and we as a small country uh, can, you know, can make a fist against larger countries, support increase. The similar thing you see is that overall what we know is that people judge the EU by how well it benefits their own economy. So if we take the mid so-called misery index, inflation and unemployment, right, in the previous year, and we try to predict support for European integration, so is membership a good thing, we see a <coughs> negative relation. That's the, that's the, upper, um, for the, the, the upper graph. If we now control or interact this, moderate this, by if a country holds the presidency, this negative relationship disappears. So people apparently think that when their country wields more power in Europe, it's fine. Right? So what does that mean now? What does that mean for the British case? What, what does that mean for if we think about Europe integration? I do think it means something for Europe, but not as my respected colleague, for example, Simon Hicks says, we need to elect a president, we need to elect a commission, and that's the problem of accountability. I think what's lacking in the European Union is empowerment of national governments and national parliaments. And if that, and in that way, if we look at, we don't know about what, what Cameron is trying to do, but in some ways what, what Cameron is bringing on the table is trying to regain some control over an integration process. As long as it also allows other member states to do what it wants, it doesn't necessarily need to be problematic. So that was my two cents on the topic. Thank you very much. Well, there's a lot, of, lot there to digest. I was trying to pull it together and I, I, I think my, my sort, of, um, sort of summary of what I heard there was <coughs> that the centre probably won't hold, um, but it may not matter, and it may not matter for a number of reasons. It may not matter because it, um, European elections, at least in the UK, are treated like by-elections and give an opportunity to effectively kick the um, more elite political parties. Um, there is this um, inevitable um, association with the rise of insecurity um, and, um, and that's linked to a number of other factors such as globalization and what have you. Um, and as David said, actually when it come, you know, when the, the, the rubber hits the road, people don't really care too much about Europe. Um, and given that it um, doesn't matter, I think then Catherine then sort of goes on to say um, that actually the fact that um, people are skeptical and are challenging those institutions <coughs> is probably a good thing and is an illustration of some form of maturity with both Europe as a concept and the engagement of the citizens of Europe within that um, European um, construct. So I, hopefully that's a reasonably fair summary. I'll let you come back and, and, and challenge that. But I'd very much like to open discussion up um, to the audience. And what I'd like to do is to um, take sort of two or three questions at a time. 
um, and again, give the opportunity of our panelists to respond to those. Um, we do have um, microphones, and it would be very helpful if you could just briefly introduce yourself, um, saying where you come from. So anybody would like to open up with questions? Yep. Hi, uh, Anna Menon from King's. I've just got a question for Catherine on this notion of loser's consent, which it seems to me goes to the very heart of the problem with the EU system as it is now, because a large number of people are going to vote against established parties and against European integration in these elections. And what they'll see coming out of it, because of the way the EU system works, is a grand coalition that does everything precisely as it used to do things before. Uh, so in terms of a sense of empowerment, the EU is uniquely bad at providing this, because, partly because power is so dispersed within it, partly because of the way elections work, partly because of this big centrist lump that shares nothing in common apart from more integration, generally, which is precisely what the people are voting against. Uh, so don't we reach a stage at which a lack of loser's empowerment threatens the existence of the system? Okay, any other questions at the back? <coughs> Thanks. My name's Marley Morris from uh, Counterpoint Research Consultancy. Uh, I just have a question about, um, about the actual the topic of the debate, about whether the censor will hold. I guess there are two sort of key uh, points of view on this, I think, at the moment uh, in the debate. On the one hand, you have people like Simon Hicks saying, you know, populists or Eurosceptics could get sort of close to 30% of the vote in the European Parliament elections. Um, that could uh, have a significant impact on how the European Parliament operates. Um, on the other hand, you have people like uh, Cass Moody saying, no, 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 it's not going to have any impact at all. They're going to do much less than everyone expects. No one's going to care. They'll just continue. Uh, the centrist parties will, will dominate, and this is all a fuss over nothing. So I'm just interested to see what, uh, what view the panel prefers out of those two. And there is a question, the gentleman in the centre here. Thank you very much. Martin Bond, I was a long time a, a European bureaucrat and also from time to time a journalist and an academic. Um, I, I think I take slight, I, I mean I have lots of agreement with lots of points made on the panel, but it's very hard to find the common element that joins the, the three uh, proposals, as it were, or the three analyses. Um, it, it's quite evident that the situation is now grown to a point where it is more disturbing than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Absolutely clear. Uh, that's seems to crystallize around the question of trust and assent, whether it's loser's assent or everyone's assent is another question. I think during that period we've seen what looks like a shift of power um, away from a national center to European center. I'm not at all sure that that's real, but it's certainly apparent. Um, and I think that behind that apparent but not real shift uh, is an illusion. And it's the illusion or delusion, a delusion of the masses, actually. Uh, the elites see pretty well what, what, how, the, how the game is played. The masses don't. The masses think that their national governments have been disempowered. They're quite wrong. Their national power governments are still very much in the saddle, more so than they were at an earlier stage when it looked as if they were going to be unseated. Um, in the Delors years, or just after the Delors years, it looked as if things might have changed. They didn't. Uh, they didn't change radically, though they changed apparently. The European Parliament has become an apparently more powerful body. And in many details of legislation, indeed it is. But the details of legislation are the policy end of it. That's not what people are about. They're about power. Politics is about power, not policy. And th th that is, I think, what drives people into the arms of the opposition to Europe position across different areas. Not all far right, by the way. Everyone seems to have argued at the moment that this is a, a threat from the right, as it were. Far from it. I think this is a threat from both ends of the political spectrum. Um, and, well, my, my question is, back to the panel, sorry, not the analysis. Looking at your own analysis, your analysis of the two other members of the panel who spoke before or after you, what do you see as common ground with the three people in the, on that panel? What do you see you share with your neighbours in the analysis or the prognosis? Okay, well, thank you very much for those um, three questions. Um, Catherine, maybe I'll start with you, if that's okay. Yes, for the, for the sake of argument, of course, I kind of wanted to say that there is absolutely nothing uh, uh, the matter, but I actually think that what, what the lasting effect of the crisis is, 
at the crisis has been, actually, is that it's really uh, differentiated the core from the periphery, i.e. certain member states that wield power because they have bought into the German model. You see that, for example, of opinion polling and people trusting Merkel. So there's a huge south-north divide. Uh, I don't know that it wasn't um, uh, in, the, uh, in the east. So in that way, if you think about a Spain or a Greece, not in terms of what you, were, what you were asking around in terms of loser's consent, if there's not concessions made and this takes on longer in those, in those systems, that's problematic. The only problem, of course, for these countries very often is, is that what they, what they, my partner is Spanish, I know this very well, uh, their own governments are, are problematic as well in many ways, right? So there's not really an exit option, where in Britain, then the discussion very clearly comes into an exit option. So even if there's a lot of loser's consent, I think many Europeans, Euro European leaders wouldn't worry about that too much because they, you know, they, they, don't, they don't imagine Greece directs it or, s or Spain directs it. But I, I do think that there should be mechanisms in place, which I would think is, for example, a more, more national elements, interests being represented at an equal measure, not just in terms of population, but at, at an equal level in, in Europe to deal with some of that. David? Um, I wouldn't dissent for a minute from your analysis about the difference between the reality and, and what is apparent. I, I think you're right. Um, but being right doesn't mean to say <laughs> as we know, that um, the world and its friends stands up and recognises it and acknowledges it and behaves differently. I think I was very much taken by Peter's point about the degree of alienation that there is for a multitude of other reasons <coughs> across the piece in Europe and in the rest of the world. And I think that insofar as that atmosphere continues, if that experience continues, um, we look at the sort of the, the meat grind that people have been through in Greece uh, and in other countries in Europe. I mean, it's breathtaking to me that there hasn't actually been a, a, w a war started in terms of what, so but it strikes me, it's not a very helpful or positive answer, but whilst people are going through those experiences, I don't think the rest matters. What they will see is, if you like, their own condition. They will see the inability of their own government to deal with it, and they may also see other elements of Europe being the cause of some of their difficulties. Mm -hmm. And in that atmosphere, that's a very toxic mix. Mm -hmm. And I really don't see uh, easily, if I had an answer, I promise you I'd give it to you after I, well, I'd copyright it first and then I'd <laughs> generously give it to you. Mm -hmm. But I, I see no answer to that. We, it's something that we have to brute our way through and please God we'll get through it. But whilst it exists, I just don't see anything that's going to persuade people um, in anything other than that Europe, for many of them, is a significant part of the problem. Yeah, I, I agree with, with, with what David's just said. And uh, it seems to me there is a, a common thread of, uh, all, in all three of our presentations is, is different aspects of a phenomenon of alienation, mm -hmm. yes. um, uh, which I believe has economic roots, but has as well institutional, uh, uh, appears in institutional form. Um, and um, I was saying by Catherine's charts, and certainly in, in, in Britain, um, we at YouGov have, have tracked trust in various institutions and, and across the piece, with a single exception, every, every institution, every group of people in, in authority, trust has declined over the last 10 years. The, the exception is judges. We can have a separate discussion as to <laughs> why that should be. Um, and, and, and I would guess that across much of Europe, if you track trust in, 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 in the media or in business, for example, in banks, you, you, you would get similar kinds of long-term declines. So Europe is caught within that. Um, let me, if I may, pick up a couple of very specific points were made. One about the European Parliament. I, I think this is this is fascinating. What's going to happen? I, I, my impression, and obviously it depends a bit on the outcome. But I'm assuming we go from, depending on precisely how you define sort of populist stroke nationalist parties, we've got 55 to 60 at the moment. I imagine it'll go up to 100 or so in the new European Parliament out of 700. So it'll be a significant minority, but it will be only a minority. And of course, it will be a divided minority because you know, UKIP won't get into bed with the um, Front National and, and so on. And indeed, I think UKIP in the last couple of days has said they won't bother to turn up to vote because um, that's not you know, their, their interest. So, um, I, so I, I think there will be the capacity for a lot of noise, a lot of mischief, a lot of grandstanding, 
Um, but I think in terms of Azua output, the decisions the European Parliament takes, now Azua, the optimistic view, uh, although I accept Azua the democratic challenge, is that the centre will come together and assert its majority. Although you do hear people saying, well, on some issues, you maybe get you, you know, that the, the EPP will start to make common cause on some specific issues with more populist parties. So there are probably people in this hall who know these dynamics far better than, than, than I um, as, as, as to what what will happen. The other point that, that Martin made about the illusion, and I think this is, I think this is a real problem of <coughs> of explanation and also a, 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 of journalism as well as of, of, of politics. Um, I, I will now break one of my own rules, as, and, and I will br briefly talk about my wife's work as, as, as high representative, which is that foreign policy is unanimity. There is no qualified majority voting. So whatever uh, Cathy does, she has to carry all 28 member states with her, and a lot of her work is making sure that they all do line up. Um, but having done that, she's able to do quite a lot of stuff. On, on the Balkans, on Iran, the piracy of Somalia, now in the Ukraine. So do you say this is Europe arrogantly taking power away from national parliaments, and it can perhaps look like that, however benign the outcome, or do you say actually in the modern real world countries have to rub along together? They've got to find ways of cooperating and perhaps one of the things that, that one of the stories that is not properly told, and we can decide I have two very good journalist friends of mine here, so I will not blame any faction in particular, but the story has not got across about how the modern world needs to work and in large part unsung through the European Union does work. Thank you. Um, <coughs> we have two hands going up down here, Lord Hurd and then okay. Europe. I think the, the, the problem is that we live in uh, a world which expects uh, quick developments um, and, and, we, and we don't get them. Um, we greatly exaggerated um, the rate at which nationalism would decay um, and uh, we are therefore alarmed. Uh, by what happens by the massacres in the Middle East, um, but also by the sheer sort of instability um, that, that the world is, is clearly in. And we, we, we are light years away from the sort of optimism that um, uh, Woodrow Wilson had uh, briefly in his, in his, in his time. Um, I don't think the answer to that is to uh, accelerate madly the pace of institutional change uh, because I don't think that's realistic. Um, national interests are, are real interests um, and, um, uh, and they will remain. What you have to do is gradually bring them together, gradually increase the number of subjects, the number of occasions on which the 28 um, actually are willing to work together. And we do see, but it's a snail's pace, but we do see that happening. Um, you, it will be very hard now to imagine, I think, the kind of um, uh, emotions which the outbreak of war in 1914 uh, produced among the, 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 the populations. Um, the, the, the actual enthusiasm, the, 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 um, the enthusiasm for war, um, and, and of course, it was actually the fact that that enthusiasm faded rather rather quickly over over four years uh, that, that produced some of the present uh, attitudes. So I think that you know we just all of us, but particularly politicians and particularly journalists, we 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 need to slow down our expectations. The 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 the, the, the thing is working, but it's working on a sort of Chinese time scale. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and maybe in a, in, a, in a century or two, we'll, we'll begin to have be see measurable progress. Thank you. There, there was a gentleman behind you. Um. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Euripides. I'm the High Commissioner of Cyprus. Um, 
one question that may need to be answered that if the European Union did not exist, would we invent it? Uh, uh, because I think people would agree that there is a great disconnect. The people do not have direct, uh, they feel alienated, all these things that have been said by the panel. Now, if we all assume and we agree about the uh, um, axiom that all politics is local politics, and assuming that the connecting thread of the panel is, is that the center will probably not hold, I would like the panel to reflect on how that affects locally here, i.e., the elections, the referendum, which people say that even if Labour comes in, probably we will have it, and of course a Scottish referendum. How do these things are somehow linked together? Because I think they are, and, and I would like to have the reflections. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We had a, yep, over here. Um, Rosaline Hughes, King's College. Looking ahead beyond the Euro elections, do you think that the Labour Party can possibly avoid being backed into promising a referendum in the next general election? And if there is a referendum, can you envisage any set of circumstances in which the British public won't vote to leave the European Union? Thank you. Um, we have one question here, and I know there are a couple of other hands, and I'll do you this way and then come back. <clears throat> thanks, thanks so much, uh, uh, John Neum. I did my PTC here uh, a year before the first direct European election in 1979. Now, my question, I hope it's not too cynical, but I just wonder whether or not uh, European elections are seen as a gigantic protest vote. I'm thinking as much of the performance of the Greens in 1989 um, as UKIP uh, more recently. So <clears throat> my question is quite simply, in the light of the likelihood that UKIP are going to become either first or second in the forthcoming contest, who's going to panic most, uh, Conservatives <laughs> or Labour? Uh, I wish, and I think I'm probably being very naive here, I just wish there could be a serious uh, discussion in this forthcoming campaign on the crisis in the Eurozone and maybe Ukraine, but I very much doubt we'll get it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. David, do you want to take the lead on that? Colleague Gosh, um, in terms of uh, the election and its impact uh, on British politics and on the um, referendum in Scotland, the referendum in Scotland I think is complicated. I have differences with colleagues about this. And the reason I say I think it's complicated is that although everything is currently being seen in Scotland through the prism of the referendum, it's rather more complicated than that because if you vote in the referendum, if you vote in the European elections in Scotland, um, and you know the Labour Party and the SNP and the Lib Dems are broadly on the same side in terms of wanting to stay in, and the Conservatives wanting to stay in, or but maybe degrees of ambiguity there. So, how do you disaggregate that vote to say that it gives you some deep insight? into what's going to happen in the referendum when, of course, they're on completely different sides. So I, I'm not trying to be trivial about it, but I genuinely have a problem about saying that there will be evidence, you know, the day after the European election is announced in Scotland, we'll be able to see and foretell what's going to happen in the referendum. I don't believe it myself. Others may have a mu much better answer to that. On Rosaline's question, can Labour avoid a referendum? It depends entirely on, of course, on the decision that Miliband and others make in the Labour Party as to whether the game is worth the candle. You will have heard me express the view that it doesn't matter. The Conservatives think they've got a spiffing wheeze. You know, if, if Miliband doesn't endorse a referendum, gotcha! Well, again, without boring you and going back and repeating all my nonsense, where is there evidence that such a thing will have a material impact on anything? in the election. It's not to say that the issue isn't important, but the idea that people are going to go to a ballot station and they're going to think, I'm voting Labour, and then a bubble will appear above their head and it says, oh, Miliband is opposed to a referendum. And, no! And then they'll cross, it. I don't believe it. I'm being, I'm, forgive me, I'm being half a seizure, but I just don't believe it. So for my part, his choice is a free one because I don't think he's going to be crucified. I don't think Labour is going to be disadvantaged. I don't think its chances and prospects in the next election, however good or bad they are, will be impacted by that. And finally, who panics most if UKIP do well? I suspect the Conservatives, for whom, as I said, I think they believe it's the stuff of nightmares. 
Um, and the thing about UKIP is, and the danger for the political parties is, that for most of its 20 years' existence, UKIP has made no impact on domestic politics. If you look at the 2009 European election, 16.5% share of the vote. 11 months later, general election, 3.2%. 80% of their members lost their deposit. Only one out of the 550 they put up got more than 10%. May 2013, oh yes. That's when it changed because they made an impact in a domestic election in the county elections. They got 20% of the votes cast. They only stood in a three quarters of the seats. They got on average 25%. In by-elections of councils at the moment, they're getting on average in seats they stand 22%. Doesn't mean to say they're gonna win the next election, seats at the next election, but it does mean I would put it to you that they are now a much more serious proposition because the question comes, if they don't, they may not win any seats, but do they determine the outcome by where they take those votes from? And there are a lot of them out there. Peter. Um, let me start with the high, high Commissioner's question. Would we then the EU if it didn't exist? Um, when I was a student, there was a board game called Diplomacy. I have no idea if it still exists. And it was, it, it was set in Europe shortly before the First World War. Each player was a country. And essentially, there were only two outcomes. Either the rest of Europe ganged up on Germany and Germany lost, or the rest of Europe didn't gang up on Germany and Germany won. And sort of there's an enduring truth to that through the 20th century. <laughs> and, the, and the great thing about the European